Next up, the virtue advantage, what humans possess that technology cannot. As advanced as technology can be, humans possess the unique ability to will the good of another. Computers can provide efficiencies but cannot choose virtue. Therefore, the human element will always, always be in demand. Dr. Andrew Abella, our next speaker, he's the founding dean of the Bush School of Business at the Catholic University of America. And he's here to share St. Thomas Aquinas' treatment of virtue as the timeless blueprint for character. Dr. Abella will address six common misunderstandings about virtue and share scientific uh, revelations about the benefits of virtue. He served as consultant to Fortune 500 companies uh, with Dr. Joseph Capizzi. Dr. Abella co-authored the award-winning book, A Catechism for Business. He earned the Acton Institute's Novak Award for his, quote, significant contributions to the study of the relationship between religious and economic liberty. He holds a Bachelor of Science from the University of Toronto, an MBA from Switzerland's Institute for Management Development, and a PhD in Marketing and Ethics from the University of Virginia's Darden Business School. Born and raised on the island of Malta, Dr. Abella and his wife Kathleen are the parents of six children. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Abella. Thank you very much. That's it. We don't need that. That's good. Um, so I am going to talk about the human side of technology. Uh, what are the human requirements for capturing all of the benefits and saving us from all of the risks that we have been talking about? And, and the answer I'm going to give was suggested to me by reading my colleague uh, Jay Richards' book, uh, The Human Advantage. Uh, Jay was talking about what kinds of human capabilities are not at risk of being replaced by machine intelligence. And his answer was, virtue, and I think that's the same answer for us, that without virtue, we're not able to realize or, or manage the prospects and the threats of these new technologies. When I was first talking to Matt about this topic, I figured I'd spend the first part of this speech trying to, to make that point, but I think the recent events have made it a lot easier for me to make that case um, that it doesn't matter how secure a technology is if the people implementing it aren't trustworthy. Uh, but here's an interesting point. My focus today is not going to be specifically about morality, which is often what people think about when you hear the word virtue. I want to focus on something much broader than morality. And the best way I can explain this, perhaps appropriately, is with a computer systems analogy. Think of a basic, very simple, computer system, say your laptop or even an iPhone. Think of, um, so here's the hardware down at the bottom right of the screen, the, um, which you use to run various applications on, on your phone, on your laptop. And then in between the two is the operating system, whether that's Android or Windows or, or iOS. I think there's an equivalent with human beings. So the human beings, we're kind of like the hardware here. Okay, um, the things we use, the skills we have, the technologies we, we use, those are the apps. Those are, those are the kind of the things we use to do work. What is, the, what is the equivalent for human beings of our operating system? What is the human operating system? For us, I think it is the daily habits of everyday life. The things we do almost unconsciously, without which all of our skills, technologies, and so on, would be, certainly don't reach their potential if they're even useful at all. Our habits of how we think, how we interact with others, how we react to stimuli. Um, in other words, the habits that we used to call virtues. So virtue is the human operating system. Now here's a question for you. What, what happens when you don't regularly update the operating system on your phone or on your laptop? where well, stuff doesn't run as fast, maybe it doesn't run at all, you're more susceptible to being hacked. It's the same thing with human beings. If people aren't growing in virtue, it's like we're not updating the human operating system or the operating system of the organization we work in or even of our whole society. And therefore, our use of technology, no matter how cool the technology is, how new, how fast, how secure, things don't work very well. So for example, 
what is the point of having a secure transaction platform if the people hosting it aren't trustworthy? What is the point of having super fast transaction speeds if you're crippled by anxiety, say? What is the point of having an unalterable blockchain if you're too disorganized to make sure that the, the first block, the genesis block in, in the blockchain doesn't have exactly the correct data, right? Then everything else following it is, is wrong, the zero state problem, they call it. Now, each of these problems ref relates to a virtue. So untrustworthiness, that's related to the vir virtue of truthfulness. Anxiety is related to the virtue of resilience, the habit of kind of persevering even through psychological um, stress. And sloppiness is related to the virtue of diligence. So the, the biggest problem though with my making the case that virtue is absolutely essential for us to proceed with these technologies and thrive is the word virtue itself. It's a word whose meaning has shifted over the centuries. So I'm not sure that there's a common understanding of it, um, what it means, and even if when people understand what it means, whether they, they think it's a good idea. So uh, in the introduction, they said I'd cover six misunderstandings. I added one more. Um, so, so instead of talking about, as I, as I said, we're not going to be looking at so much at morality. So instead of talking about the Ten Commandments, I'm going to talk about the seven objections, the seven objections to the idea of virtue and, and why I think we can dispose of each. And so the first objection is, is virtue even a thing? Um, some argue, philosophers in particular argue, that people do different things in different situations, that we don't have stable qualities, that I might be courageous in one situation, I might be cowardly in another, and different again in, in a, yet another situation. So is, is virtue a stable thing? Um, we're seeing a number of philosophers working to oppose this, this idea, this objection, uh, leading among them is a professor, Nancy Snow, working with several colleagues, at the juncture of philosophy and psychology to show using uh, psychological research that in fact human beings do have certain stable dispositions. Um, some people are courageous, some people are thoughtful, some people are diligent and so on. So that that virtue is in fact a thing, it, it does actually exist. Um, but that quickly, uh, Na Nancy and colleagues are working in the field of um, moral philosophy and what they call now moral psychology. So that leads us immediately to the next objection, is virtue just about morality? Because it's amazing how defensive people get when you're talking about morality, which should just be such a beautiful thing, but you get this, you know, don't put your morality on me, you know? So, so virtue is about morality, I don't want it, is the, is the reaction we get. Um, but the answer is that, that virtue is not just about morality, it's not even primarily about morality. Virtue is about human excellence in, in total, not just moral excellence. So moral excellence is a piece of it, but we're talking about excellence, excellence in, in thought, in, in our actions, and in, our, in dealing with our feelings, dealing with our emotions. All of that is the subject of, of virtue. Our, our third objection is, yeah, that's very nice, but is there any scientific basis to any of this? And the answer here is absolutely yes, in the entire field of what is called positive psychology, read by Professor Martin Seligman, uh, founded officially about 20, 20 some years ago. This is their uh, masterpiece work, uh, uh, the Handbook of Character Strengths and Virtues, published by, the, uh, by Oxford University Press. Uh, Seligman went on to become the head, of the president of the American Psychological Association. So this is a very serious, um, respected subfield of psychology, positive psychology, where they study individual virtues empirically, so scientifically, and look at what do they look like, um, what does it take to grow in certain virtues, what are the benefits from having different virtues, and so on. So far, so good. The next virtue is one that is, tends to be more subconscious than, than spoken, and that is, aren't virtues fixed qualities that are kind of more or less genetic? Um, that at least since you've grown up, are you kind of stuck with what you have? Uh, so people will say things like, she's a courageous person, or he's very creative, or I'm not very organized. You know, we'll, we'll, make, we'll give each other these labels. The implication is these are sort of fixed qualities we have. That's the way I am, you know, and that's not subject to change. And if you look at dictionaries, you see this view is more or less reinforced 
because of the definition that is given of, of virtue. So the Cambridge Dictionary definition is a, a virtue is a good moral quality in a person or the general quality of being morally good. Oxford says a moral quality regarded, especially in religious contexts, as good or desirable in a person. Macmillan, a quality that is useful in a particular activity. But thinking of virtue as a quality suggests that it is something fixed, a property of, of myself that is fixed, not subject to change, such as, for example, my height. So the height, the fact that I am five foot 10 is a quality of Dr. Abella. Now I have a colleague, um, some of our students are in the room, they recognize Professor Widmer. Professor Widmer, he, the quality of his height is that he is six foot eight, so he's really tall. And when he's teaching a class with 110, 120 students, he has no problem in keeping order in that class because he's a big guy. If you said to me, Dr. Abella, you would be a more impressive teacher if you were six foot eight like Professor Widmer, I would say, thank you for nothing. That is useless advice, right? Like, what can I do with that other than maybe wear platform shoes, right? There's no way I can get to be, get to be six foot eight. And if we think of virtues like we think of, say, height, that's the reaction. If I said to a student, you need to be more courageous, speak up more in class, you need to be more orderly, you're a mess, you know? So, um, they would say, well, th that's just the way I am. There's nothing I can do about that. Um, some of you may be familiar with the book Mindsets by Carol Dweck. Um, she talks about the difference between a fixed and a growth mindset. If we see virtue as a fixed, uh, if we see virtue as a, qual quali a quality that we have, not subject to change, that's a fixed mindset. Um, and if we see virtue, we understand virtue as a habit, a good habit, then we recognize that like any habit, it can be improved or can be acquired. Um, uh, so uh, uh, it's better to think of a virtue as a good habit than to think about it as a quality. That through practice, we can acquire pretty much any, any habit. Uh, there are a couple of popular books right now, um, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg and Atomic Habits by James Clear. The second one has sold over two million copies. Anybody read or, or familiar with any of these books? Very successful books. They talk about how to cultivate, how to grow in a particular habit, how to uh, build a good habit, how to get rid of a bad habit. They don't mention the word virtue at all, but everything that they write is basically about virtue because a virtue is a habit, so it applies to virtue. Um, and and what, they, what they show, what they argue, I think correctly, is that once you cultivate a habit, a little bit at a time through practice, it becomes part of you. It becomes part of your character so that something that was once difficult for you or even unimaginable is now something that you do routinely, almost effortlessly. So maybe you used to be messy and disorganized, and now you are organized. Um, you used to have difficulty making friends. Now you make friends more easily. So you've, you've kind of updated your, your human operating system by, by, by analogy, by growing in, in a particular virtue. There are also numerous other self-help books, each one of which is kind of focusing on one or a small group of virtues. So you've, maybe you've heard of the, the book Grit, another bestseller by Angela Duckworth, uh, is basically the virtue of, of perseverance. Um, another one called Discipline is Destiny by Ryan Holiday, kind of drawing on Stoic philosophy, basically about self-discipline or the virtue of temperance, which I'll say more about. Uh, Brene Brown's work, uh, particularly the seminal Daring Greatly, uh, when she talks about vulnerability, uh, a combination of, I think, uh, fortitude or courage, uh, truthfulness, um, and, and humility. Kind of th that's what she's, she's drawing from there. Again, these books don't mention the word virtue typically, um, but this stuff is out there, uh, and it's a sort of growing recognition of the importance of, um, importance of virtue. Um, objection number five. Okay, so virtue is a habit, can be cultivated, but that's just an individual, personal thing. Nothing, it doesn't have anything of great social relevance. Even that's false. Um, virtue truly is our kind of social uh, uh, operating system. When people grow, even in just one particular virtue, um, it can have widespread consequences for society. There's a group of uh, faculty at, at Harvard running something called the Human Flourishing Program, where they do a lot of empirical study of, of virtue as well. Um, and they've been focusing on, um, so they, they come from um, 
the, the view of public health. They've been looking at virtue as an issue for public health. Particularly, they've been looking at the virtue of forgiveness. And, and they argue that you can consider the lack of forgiveness in most people to be a serious public health issue. Why health? Because we know from their research and other research that when you have difficulty forgiving others and you keep that sort of anger and resentment in you, it actually has physical, negative physical effects on you. You get sick from that. You get physically sick from that. And that when you learn to forgive, as we all can, even, even among secular audiences, you can learn, learn to forgive. It's obviously always easier. All of this is easier with grace, of course. Um, but if you learn to forgive, you actually experience not just psychological but physical health benefits from that. And so they're arguing if we could have a widespread kind of attempt to, to, to all learn to grow in forgiveness, we'd see a big improvement in, in public health. So there's this, this broad kind of social benefit of, of uh, virtue. <clears throat> okay, then the number six, virtue yeah, it may be relevant to personal, to social life, but does it have anything to do with business at all? And, and clearly, if we're talking about these technologies, most of them are enacted through business, so that's very relevant. Well, the answer here is yes as well. Uh, recently, in the last couple of years, a uh, consulting firm, McKinsey and Company, <clears throat> with whom I spent six of my more formative years, uh, published a white paper talking about what they call distinct elements of talent. The, the basis of the white paper, based on a number of surveys uh, internationally, was that employee skills are important, but what's more important is that underneath those, employees have what, these, what they call these distinct elements of talent, like courage, empathy, humility, i.e. virtues. Again, they don't use the word virtue, but that's exactly what they are talking about. Similar paper by Deloitte, they call them enduring human capabilities like creativity, resilience, but also courage, empathy, humility. So again, talking about virtue, but not, not using that word. So uh, recognition from these consulting firms of the importance of virtue in corporations. And then we have the study of what's called positive organizations that grew up in parallel with the study of positive psychology led by Professor Kim Cameron at the University of Michigan. Um, they do empirical research showing that uh, companies, organizations run by virtuous leaders tend to have better outcomes, better financial outcomes. So, so not just um, lower turnover, say staff turnover, but, but also um, better, rev better revenue growth, better profitability, and so on. It, it is the, <clears throat> the joy of academic research to prove uh, empirically what we as Catholics knew all along, right? If you're good virtuous people running a business, the business would run better. We have empirical evidence, empirical support for that. Okay, final objection. So, um, virtue is a good habit, can be developed, very good impact on, in, uh, on us as individuals, as a society, and, our, and on our businesses. But how big is this problem? Is every positive abstract noun a virtue, right? Um, if so, there could be thousands upon thousands of virtues. And, and, and where would I even begin? You know, is tolerance a virtue? Yeah, what about attentiveness? Is that a virtue? Is persuasiveness a virtue? Is concentration a virtue? Is there a never-ending list of virtues? And, and well, how am I, I going to focus? How do, how do I do anything with this, right? It's just, uh, it feels impossible. In fact, there is a group of approximately 50 virtues, five zero, that pretty much cover all you need to have a great life. Uh, 50 might seem like a lot, uh, but over a lifetime, that's more than a year each, you know, it's, it's, it's doable, right? It's better than thousands, certainly, right? Better than thousands of possible virtues. My authority here is St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, in the Summa, he lists these approximately 50 virtues and organizes them to show which one fits to what part of life. In, in the Middle Ages, this was commonly displayed as uh, what they call the tree of virtues. So given a figure of a tree, uh, um, this is an example. And he features, or they feature the four cardinal virtues here, but just like the word virtue, the names of the cardinal virtues don't always mean what they originally meant to us. So uh, prudence um, is not being a scaredy cat. Uh, prudence means the, the habit of making wise decisions. Right? So that's right there on the tree. Uh, justice, fortunately, we still have a similar meaning to the, the correct meaning to the name, the, the habit of treating others fairly. Uh, fortitude or courage is the habit of doing the right thing even though you're afraid. Courage doesn't mean not being afraid. That's not within our control. Our emotions happen, right? 
Um, courage or fortitude is doing the right thing regardless of being afraid. And then temperance is not just the movement to ban alcohol. In fact, it's not primarily that. Temperance is the habit of only giving in to your feelings when it makes sense, when it's rational. And if you look closely at the tree, you can see each of those cardinal virtues has several other leaves around it. Those are the kind of allied, what are called allied virtues or sub-virtues, if you like, in some cases. Um, and that, incidentally, that's why the cardinal virtues are called the cardinal virtues from the Latin word cardo, which means hinge or pivot, because they are the pivotal virtues on which all these other virtues turn. Um, why are they so pivotal? And the answer lies in St. Thomas Aquinas' treatise on the virtues in the Summa. But to, to explain this, I want to tell you a little story, um, explain a little concept from my time at, at McKinsey. Is anybody in the room working now or has worked in the past as a management consultant or any kind of consultant? A bunch of you. Okay, so some of you will recognize this, right? Um, when, when we were trained as young consultants, to w work on a client problem and kind of break that problem down into its component parts so we could solve it in a thorough way, we, we were introduced to the concept of MECE, M-E-C-E. -E. Uh, it's for breaking down this problem in a way where, you, where we analyze it really well so that all of the parts of the problem that you've broken it into are mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. In other words, I've broken it into its component parts and every part is unique, there are no gaps and no overlaps. I'm not studying anything twice and I'm not missing anything. Okay, so that's a messy analysis of the problem. And in fact, we would draw it in the form of a tree because you take the main problem, say let's say you're studying a, a company and they have issues with profitability, then you might break it into revenues and costs. And then you might take costs and break them into fixed costs and variable costs and so on and so on until you kind of break it down into all the component parts. So what does all of this have to do with the treatise on the virtues? Well, during the pandemic, with the extra time that I had on my hands, because I have a 90-minute commute each way to Catholic University, so I got three hours a day of extra time during the pandemic, I did what any good business dean would do, and I went back and I reread big chunks of the Summa Theologica. So <laughs> well, any good business dean at Catholic University would want to do that, right? So, so but particularly, with particular attention to the the St. Thomas's treatise on the virtues, the part of the Summa that's about the virtues. And I discovered that St. Thomas's virtue tree is actually a Misi breaking apart of all of human life. So in the same way that we at McKinsey would take a business problem, break it down into its components, St. Thomas took all of human life, broke it down into, into, into its components and showed that there's a proper virtue for every aspect of human life. And, and, and many of them hinge on the cardinal virtues. I'll show you what I mean. So, so here's, here, this is my drawing of, of St. Thomas's virtue tree. So you start with human life. Um, he divides it into the spiritual and material side. So the supernatural and the natural sides of our life. Uh, the, 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 part, the material life, the part of us that is proper to us as created beings, and the spiritual life or the supernatural, the part that is proper to being divinized, right, to, to being in relationships with, with God. Uh, he takes material life, a natural life, and breaks it into the intellectual life and then our practical or day-to-day -day life. Uh, intellectual life being the life of the mind where we're thinking just for the sake of thinking. We're just um, purely intellectual. And then the practical is everything else. It's how we spend 99% of our, our, our time, right? The spiritual life, he said, of course, we have the three virtues, the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. He breaks those down, but I'm going to skip over that because I want to get to the sort of practical life. In the intellectual life, three virtues of wisdom, science, and understanding. I want to dive deeper into the practical life. I can't fit it all on one slide, so I have to make a new slide uh, just for the practical life part. What he, so he observes that all day long, we are basically doing one or more of three things, our thoughts, our actions, and our feelings. In, in Thomistic terms, our intellect, our will, and our passions, for the, those who have seminary education, right? I, I translate those into more day-to-day -day terms, but I think that's a fairly accurate translation. So if you think about it, this is me -see, right? So, so what do you do all day long that doesn't involve thinking, taking action, or dealing with your feelings. That, that's comprehensive, right? It, it, everything is there. Um, the virtue of prudence, 
so the, the habit of making wise decisions is what perfects our thinking. Because our thinking, day to day, is usually ordered to making decisions. What should I do next? What should I have for lunch? Who should I talk to now? Etc. So the virtue of prudence perfects our thoughts. The virtue of justice, the habit of, doing the, of treating others fairly, is what perfects our actions, right? We are, we are called to act justly. So we have the virtue of justice, then our action is, is perfected. St. Thomas then observes and uh, divides our feelings into two kinds, fears and desires. So, so there are two kinds of emotion that we feel. He's saying, generally speaking, emotions that repel us, so fear, that make us not want something, right? And then em emotions that attract us, uh, or desires, that make us want something. There's a virtue for each of those as well. So for our fears is the virtue of fortitude, the habit of doing the right thing even though you're afraid, and the virtue of temperance, uh, the habit of, of only giving into your feelings when they make sense. So, so temperance doesn't mean you have to deny all desires. It means you have to evaluate your desires and say, yeah, that's a good desire. I should do that. Or that's not a good desire. I should not have the seventh donut. You know? so, um, but now you can see why the cardinal virtues are so pivotal. I expect many people in this room um, have already heard of the four cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. You may have at one point wondered, or maybe I'm the only guy who wonders about these things, but you may have wondered why those four, right? Why always those four virtues? And, and the answer you might get is, well, the ancients used to talk about those four, and for thousands of years people pointed those four, so kind of by tradition. Well, there's a much better answer than that, and, and St. Thomas gives it to us right now. If you have those four virtues, you have every aspect of daily life covered, your thoughts, your actions, your feelings, right? If you, if you are prudent, just, and have fortitude and temperance, you are an excellent human being. Isn't that cool, right? So, so just those four virtues. Now, to be fair, those are big virtues. It's not easy to grow in prudence like overnight or any of those four. It can be done. So what St. Thomas does is he continues to break them down into their subcomponents or, or what are sometimes called allied virtues. So let's, I want to show you some examples of this. So let's I'll pick on fortitude. So we, we kind of double click on fortitude and look what that tree looks like. What St. Thomas observes is that fortitude itself, um, you can divide into sort of fears of deadly things. So, so fear in, in the face of a deadly danger, and then every other kind of fear. That's a kind of a very important distinction, he says. Um, and that fortitude, the, the virtue fortitude proper, really belongs only in situations where you could die. You know, so, so you're somebody going into combat or, or a a police officer going into a difficult situation, a mom giving birth in a risky pregnancy, things where there's a risk of death, okay? Stepping on an airplane. <laughs> anyway, um, but in, in all other challenging situations, he continues to break it down. He says, we can have fears of other kinds of challenges, some challenges that can be overcome and some that cannot, right? That just have to be endured. Uh, Maybe somebody in your family has a terminal illness, for example. Like, we're going to try, we're going to try to do everything we can to heal it, but at a certain point, you know, this is terminal. You have to endure that. The person suffering it has to endure it. The family members endure it, right? Many people argue that that's actually harder. That's a kind of b bigger kind of challenge. So, th but they are different. In terms of overcoming, um, St. Thomas is a very practical guy. He says, when we're, when we're fighting a major challenge, there's two ways to attack it, with money and without. So you can spend a lot of money to solve some problems, and others you just have to put in a lot of human effort and energy. So the, with great non-financial effort and then with great financial expense are the two ways of overcoming a challenge. In terms of enduring, here the division is between mental and physical challenges. We may be facing depression or other kinds of mental fears, anxiety, and so on, or we may be facing physical challenges. I'm tired, exhausted, wounded, got to keep going. And so the virtues that fit each of these, so for great non-financial effort is the virtue of magnanimity, from the Latin magna anima, right, big soul. So the person who has a big soul has the habit of taking on big challenges. So, so not sure if Matt is here, hopefully he isn't, so I'm not embarrassing him, but you know, creating a conference like this, it's like a big idea, took a lot of effort, take a lot of risk, but I'm gonna do it anyway. That's the virtue of magnanimity. The virtue of munificence, is the willingness to spend large sums of your own money to do something important. So we see this among, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time fundraising as a, as a dean, I, I see this among many of our donors, you know, they're willing to donate 
big money to, chair, to endow a chair or to, for scholarships for students, to build a cathedral, build a renovated church, and so on. Those are all examples of the habit of munificence. In terms of enduring mental challenges is the virtue of resilience. Um, so resilience um, is basically being willing to get down, knock down psychologically and just keep on going and keep on going. It's, um, it, even, even in the face of something as tough as, say, depression, um, it's important to note that the virtue of, of resilience is actually a habit, right? It can be cultivated. And I don't think it's a, a coincidence. Uh, developing the virtue of resilience is, in fact, a common treatment for, uh, for depression. If you've heard of cognitive behavioral therapy, that's basically what it is. It's helping people grow in the virtue of resilience, even if they don't always use that, that term. And the beauty of it is growing in virtue, growing in resilience, doesn't only make you more able to resist the pain of depression, it actually makes that pain be reduced and, and, and even sometimes go away. And, and so that's an important lesson about, about virtue. It doesn't just make you kind of more able to tough it out. It actually makes the effort easier. So, so the more virtuous you become, the easier it is to do the thing that you, are, you have become habituated to, whether that is resilience or magnanimity or munificence. If, you, if, you're in the, if you're tithing, for example, when you first start tithing, giving away 10% off the top, ouch, that really hurts, you know? After a while, you don't even feel it anymore. You're doing just as good as a thing as you were doing before, but it doesn't, doesn't feel it. So that's the, beauty, this, the way God made us. The more we grow in virtue, the easier it becomes to be a good person, which, by the way, is completely contrary to modern views of ethics, you know, which is if it doesn't hurt, it can't really be ethical. Nonsense. You know, the, the, the more virtuous you are, the easier it is. And then the last one here is perseverance. Uh, this is keeping going through physical challenges. So, so you've got a deadline, uh, you're tired, you're exhausted, maybe you've even got the flu coming on or something, but you just keep on going, keep on going, because it needs to be done. That's the habit of perseverance. So I'm kind of getting in the weeds here, but I just want to give you a flavor of the, of the importance of kind of getting into this, into this detail. I'm not going to stay too long in the weeds. I'll give you a couple more examples from this time the virtue of temperance. So the habit of only giving into feelings when it makes sense. It's, it's a little more complicated. There are a few more sub-virtues. So I'll just do a couple as an example, and then, and then we can move on. Um, St. Thomas branches out first. He says we've got the feelings that are driven from our basic human desires. Those are the strongest feelings we have, um, and they are the feelings related to the continuation of our species. So related to basically food and sex, nourishment and, and, and reproduction, because if we don't eat, we die, um, and if we don't reproduce, the species dies, right? So, so that's why we, these are strong drives within us. So nourishment, uh, food, the virtue of, of abstemiousness, which is the habit of eating the right amount of food at the right time. So feasting when it's time to feast, fasting when it's time to fast, and eating just the right amount at any other time. Uh, for, with respect to drink, the virtue of sobriety, which is not never touching alcohol, it's drinking alcohol, but not to the point where it makes you stupid right, or irresponsible. So, um, and then with reproduction, the virtue of chastity, right, which is, which is only engaging in sexual intercourse within a lifelong committed relationship, so a marriage. And then you have all the other desires, which he then breaks down as well. He says the virtue of moderation applies to all the other desires, but we can go even deeper than that, where he, you can isolate desires of the mind um, and isolate those further into, say, desires to do things, which he further div divides into impulsive things. That's the virtue of restraint, uh, again, a habit Say, you know, I'm playing on, on looking around on Amazon.com and I see, you know, interesting sale. I'm going to click here. The virtue of restraint says, no, count to 10 before clicking or, or wait a minute before or wait till tomorrow before clicking. You know, they, they try not to let you do that with their like one day sale. But anyway, so you, that's the virtue of restraint is pause a little bit. Um, desires to do great things. Uh, that's the virtue of humility. So humility is the habit of, of working with your desires to do great things but doing it in a way that it, it's, it's not kind of the, the sort of uh, false humility of, oh, that's nothing, you know, nor is it the pride of, look at me, I'm so great. It's the way um, C.S. Lewis puts it is, I love this figure. He says, it's like building a cathedral and having the same joy in that cathedral as if someone else had built it. 
So it's not, oh, that cathedral, no, that was nothing, you know, or look at that great cathedral, everybody, I built that cathedral, you know, it's just like, this is, I, I, I'm happy to have contributed to this, this is a beautiful cathedral, isn't that great, you know, so that, that's humility. Um, the, the um, we could go on and on and on here. Um, so, um, but I, I, I would just sort of flip through the rest just to show you, because there's this timeline thing clicking in front of me, so keep on time. Um, and then there's also the virtue of prudence, um, also has its components, and justice as well, also has its components. So 50, approximately 50 in all, and you're thinking, how am I gonna remember all of this? I'm gonna ask that guy who's taking pictures of each one. To, I'm happy to share them. So, uh, um, but anyway, um, I'm gonna share a tool with you that we have developed for the use of our students that's available publicly on our website. And we have taken th the logic in these virtue trees and turned them into a diagnostic to help our students choose a virtue and we encourage them to pick one every semester and then work on growing in that virtue. So for example, I mentioned the virtue of resilience. That's one that a number of our students pick because it's something that young people, if we admit it, could really benefit from, it, from growing in these days. So many young people are just afraid to take a step lest, you know, something. Um, so one of the exercises that we suggest for growing in resilience is for the next 30 days, um, go and ask, uh, a question to somebody where you know the answer is going to be no, where you're going to get rejected. So go to a store to ask them to buy something which you know that they don't sell. Or um, go ask your professor for an extension uh, where the answer is going to be no. Um, you know, or, uh, and, and the purpose of this is you start to realize that somebody saying no to you doesn't kill you. And you start to get used to hearing that and, it, and, and you are growing just a little bit in the virtue of resilience. You know, we, we, we see this with, like a young man won't ask a girl out until he's checked through the back channels that she's gonna say yes, because God forbid she would say no, you know. So we, we want them to rise above that and learn that, yeah, you, that's part of resilience, uh, which is part of the virtue of fortitude, is not to be afraid of the no. And the way to learn that is to, is to grow it through, through practice. Okay, so here's, the, here's the, uh, the demo. We call it the Bush Virtue Diagnostic. And the way it works is we're starting at the top of the tree, so intellectual life, practical, spiritual life, and you click on, you know, where do I think I, want, I, I most need to grow right now? So let's say you click on practical or daily life. It zooms in and brings us to the thinking, acting, feeling part of it, right? So, okay, let's say I want to get better at um, acting, so that's gonna be the virtue of justice. Some of these virtues have little videos uh, by the Dominican fathers uh, from a series called Aquinas 101. Uh, Dominicans are now in charge of uh, campus ministry at Catholic U, so that, that was really helpful. So as we're going down the justice tree, we have a choice between things that are due to others legally and things that are due morally. Let's say I want to get better at dealing with others in a, in a moral way. Uh, so I pick morally. St. Thomas then v divides that into things that are morally necessary and then things that are morally good but not strictly all the time necessary. So I'm going that direction. Um, and there are two kinds of justice, dealing with people, dealing with things. Um, dealing with people would be the virtue of friendliness. So friendliness, the habit of friendliness, is actually a matter of justice. We owe it to others to be friendly with them. But, but St. Thomas says not, not always and not to everybody. It's impossible to be friendly to everybody. Like, I would never get off the metro if that were the case. Like, going around, hi, I'm Dr. Bell, good to meet you. Like, doesn't make sense. Right? But, but for those that I am, are put in front of me, that I'm engaging with, I ought to be friendly. But let's say I want to focus on dealing with things, that's going to be the habit, the virtue of generosity, right? So that's being, again, that, it's not absolute, otherwise I'd give away everything I have. But as, as a layperson, the virtue of generosity is being willing to part with your goods when somebody else is, is in need. And then there's a little link there. So for each of the 50 virtues, we have a document that then, I don't expect you to read any of this, so just, this stands for document, right? Um, there's a definition of the virtue, there's a summary of the empirical research fr from psychology and elsewhere, uh, advice on how to grow in that virtue, and then a bunch of case studies, examples of, in this case, what generosity looks like in an administrative or business setting. Okay, so this is, the whole tool is out there, and to find it, you just have to Google Bush Virtue Diagnostic, um, available to everybody. Um, so, so there you have it, so how to update the human operating system in 50 virtues or less, um, and, and, and the human dimension that is needed to make useful and, 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 and secure use of these new technologies, because it's not just about the technology, it's about the people. Um, so there's the operating system, and I thought I would close with that, because it's 
makes a point I'm trying to make. So <laughs> the uh, Princess Bride never goes stale, right? So, um, so I was hoping to leave a bit of time uh, to take questions, but I didn't. So sorry about that. Um, but I'll hang out during the break. I'll be here through lunch. If anybody has any questions or comments, and uh, thank you for your attention.